Okay, so thanks for having me and uh, thanks for actually coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, so I should say this is my name on it and I'm talking, but I didn't do most of the work as it is usually. I, I have the pleasure of working with a large number of people at Microsoft and interns and um, actually product people as well. And I'll talk a little bit about what happens if you try to, to build a product. Nothing good ever comes out of that is the, the short summary. Um, uh, but then, uh, so I, I should also say we are hiring if you're interested. <laughs> Okay, so maybe to explain a little bit how I ended up here, because I kind of, I feel like I'm part of this community, but practically I'm a machine learning researcher nowadays. And so what happened was my PhD is on termination proving, and I started actually on termination proving on term rewrite systems, which is, I think, as far away from practical things as you can be. And then we, we started doing Java. And so I'm, I'm showing ex leading examples from my papers during my PhD. So this is actually from my first paper. And we could prove termination of some flatten in Java, which was really just a Java implementation of the term rewriting thing that you would do to flatten a tree into a list. And then we did this. Uh, oh, this was uh, interprocedural. And the, the example grew shorter. Um, and then I proved non-termination, and it grew even shorter. And then I prove uh, things on, on data that is actually cyclic, and it gets even shorter. And then towards the end of my PhD, it got slightly longer, but we threw away the heap because we did complexity analysis for a change. Um, and so somehow I realized um, all of this stuff doesn't really work, even though it looks trivial to everyone in the room. And so wh where's this problem that you can do you can't do automatic proofs in a meaningful way on any large program for non-trivial properties, but humans have no problem doing this. So what's, what's going on there? And so this is the hardest example from my PhD that I still have not proven terminating, um, because it turns out if you do system out print line, it loads like all of these Unicode translation libraries and all of this stuff. And realistically, I mean, the, the solution to this is to cheat and to say, well, I know that print line terminates and it doesn't have any side effects and that's good but well I, see I know th this is the practical solution but I didn't want to do it and so I feel bad about it and I still can't prove this terminating so uh, there's a web interface for my tool that can do like the most amazing tricks if, as long as you don't try to use system out uh, so um, <laughs> so somehow the, the the problem there really is uh, wh where, where does this gap uh, between reasoning in humans and reasoning in machines come from? And is there something that we can do about that? That was my idea. And so my first idea was when I came to Microsoft, I should do something new. And Microsoft has like tons and tons of machine learning researchers, especially in Cambridge. And I found a guy who, who was interested in working on this. And the first idea that we had was, well, let's try to do invariance uh, synthesis. And so uh, we heard about this yesterday a little bit. And so, for example, if you want to, to prove um, that uh, this instance insertion sort algorithm is actually correct and that it uh, doesn't have any null pointer exceptions, you need these loop invariants here and here and uh, some, some specification you might want to get out as well. And so this is fairly hard, but it turned out we could actually solve this by uh, a lot of hackery and a little bit of machine learning that essentially looked at traces of programs and then said, oh, the most likely invariant at this point is the following thing, and then a counterexample guided loop to actually refine the invariance to do the right thing. And so we built that, but it's really just a, a lot of band-aids band and duct tape that kind of fit together, but uh, it does, didn't feel like a scalable solution. And the main problem in that area is that machine learning is not really set up as it is at the moment, or deep learning especially, uh, to work with highly structured data. So there is this, this weird gap where everyone looks at images and there's are grids of pixels and that's very nice. But then you look at text and well, it's a sequence of things and it's kind of more structured, but code has a completely different thing. And if you want to generate invariance, it is, it's even more structured. And somehow the, these two things are at attention. And so this is what I've been working on for the last few years. How can you integrate deep learning and programming languages? And mainly my work recently has been on deep learning on structured objects and generating structured objects in some form or another. And so the idea here really is we like programs and we like program structure because they're interpretable and they're generalizable and we know what they do but they're kind of limited to people who know how to program and they're very it's a large effort to construct these these artifacts writing invariance is a lot of work and no one really does it for for anything that is not super high value and on the other side you see deep learning 
which is really successful at getting data out of very large corpora of, the, uh, of, of samples. And it can understand images and to a certain degree language now and deal with noise and all these desirable things that you might want to, to have. But the problem there is really handling structured data doesn't really work. And so we kind of want to bring elements from program uh, languages into the deep learning and then use deep learning on program things. And so we call this area procedural artificial intelligence, which is a horrible, horrible word uh, or term, but uh, this is, uh, you, you need to sell your stuff. Um, and so the three areas that we work on are uh, understanding programs, machine learning models that somehow use program structure um, and generating programs or generating structured objects. And so I'm not going to, to talk about the middle part today, but we do things like generating molecules that have certain properties and things like that there. And so the big picture really, if you think about the, the big code thing that, uh, that Martin has been preaching for many years now, is that if you have a lot of code, you can find patterns in it, and that tells you something about how co code should look like, how people program, and it tells you something. If they deviate from that, that's maybe a problem, and you might want to help them, or you can show them these patterns, extract these patterns to kind of guide their way when you educate them. And then the other thing is, uh, as, as we heard just now, for example, um, in, uh, in natural language, uh, you are interested in kind of understanding the, the meaning of, uh, of the natural language in code, but if you just apply natural language models that, uh, uh, that don't know about the specific things that you have, where new and create are maybe similar things or not quite as similar, um, in natural language these things don't exist and somehow you need to bring this in again. And then finally, the, the great thing that hasn't been used a lot but is starting to, to become a focus of research is we not only have code but we have like an evolution of code. Code. We see how people fix bugs, how, how issues arose, how people develop things, and somehow we can learn from this data as well. And so we kind of, Microsoft has kind of this thing going now uh, where we bought GitHub to kind of have more of this. And well, realistically, all of you can play with all the GitHub data in the world that we can play with because we don't get any access to any of the private stuff. Um, but the, the advantage that Microsoft has is that we can expose new things now through GitHub. Um, and so this is the picture that we kind of have in mind when we talk about programming and how to help programmers and, and, and where to interact with them. There's this inner loop where you develop on your local machine, you, have, you edit code, you build it, you debug it, and at some point you do a pull request and you have teammates that kind of look at it, say it's wrong, and uh, then they, someone writes documentation and you, you have like this full outer circle. And all of these things kind of have opportunities where you can try to learn from past patterns and help people to be more efficient. And so we started doing this with this Visual Studio IntelliCode thing, which is actually a released product that you can go and download now as a plugin to Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. And the very first thing is context-sensitive autocomplete, which is not a new thing. Eclipse had this for many, many years, but finally you get it for Visual Studio as well. Um, and then this is my, my personal uh, baby where uh, it finds likely bugs. Uh, when you do a pull request, uh, it might give you a warning like this. Um, and say, oh, maybe you wanted to use another variable here because uh, it's strange that you're subtracting an X coordinate from a Y coordinate. Um, but this is only dog fooding internally, so you can't play with it. Uh, and then, so we do this in Python, blah, and yeah, all kinds of things. Um, so how do we actually do all of this stuff? How do we want to apply learning to programs? So the tasks that we looked at and, and which I'll use to illustrate this are, uh, one is this detecting a misused variable in a location. And so what you can do is you can look at a piece of code, you blank out one location in which a variable was used, and I'm asking you now, well, can you tell me which variable should go into this blue box? And I can tell you, well, you don't have to look at the context. The only type correct options at this point, um, because they are the only reference types around, is uh, class and first. Um, which is not true actually, I see, but whatever. And it turns out, well, it's obvious because you used first here, it was declared, and you should, of course, assert at this point that first is not null. Um, but it happens that this is the actual test as on GitHub at this point. Uh, so this is in, in like some GitHub project that we analyzed. 
Um, and what happened here clearly is someone copy and paste code, copy and pasted code, and didn't quite adapt all the uses of these things. And it's very hard to find this with like a classical static analysis tool because, on the other hand, first is not unused, so it appears here. It's not dead code in that sense, but somehow there's this duplicated statement, and you kind of to show that this statement is formally show that this statement doesn't add anything. You kind of have to show that this whole thing doesn't have any side effect that might influence this, and then you can do all of that. Yeah, so Mark, I mean, this of course can be captured by like a copy, so a copy paste bug, right? Yes. To some degree. Yes. So there's quite some work on huh? Sure. No, so what I'm saying is like um, you, you can do this, and there are specialized analyses that do all of these things. For example, the, the, these duplicated lines from copy and paste are one thing, but um, then you might end up with, uh, with other slightly different scenarios. It's just like this you, you're never going to write analyzers for all of these possible cases. So maybe it would be a good idea to learn like how should code look like. Like because of you, you didn't need to reason about copy and pasting to see what goes here. You could reason about how does code usually look like, what is the usual pattern that happens here, and then the deviation from that pattern indicates that something is wrong. And so this is the, the idea for, for this work. And then the other idea that we wanted to look into to kind of understand if we are learning something about the semantics or if we can align the semantics of natural language and code, is if we take a program and then we blank out some variable, we replace it by some extra name, can we infer a useful name back for this variable? And so here we see that we iterate over something, and if it's an even number, we sum it up. So uh, sum of even seems like a good way to, to name this variable. Um, I think in reality this was called x in the example that we found. Um, and, and I'll talk about uh, that in a little bit. Um, and so the, the question here is how would we go about this? If you look at uh, how, how programming languages people approach uh, these questions, usually it's either you say, oh, I want to prove software correct, and then you need to write down a specification. And so at this point, the project dies. And then, uh, <laughs> or then maybe, uh, maybe it continues, but then you go and say, oh, actually, I can't deal with like all of these cases, or I'll limit the, the domain that I'm handling to like this smaller fragment. Or you say, oh, I'm only doing like a small part of it. I'm not verifying the whole of SSL. I'm only doing like the crypto part in S2N. Not, uh, Project Everest is like a wonderful exception to this, but the reason why Pro Project Everest is such, uh, such a strange and unique thing is because there's hardly any other project out there that actually tries to verify a non-trivial component end-to-end. -end. I mean, there's ComCert and uh, L4 and, and these things, but it's like a very unusual thing, and it's hardly something that is done on a regular basis. And so the other idea is, well, you say we just look for bugs, and bugs we find by saying, okay, so we kind of know what a pattern is that is wrong, and then we'll just look for patterns. So all of these things, I'm sorry, I call glorified graphs. Um, they, it, it's, it's a very complex grep, and sometimes they have some semantic insight, but in the end what you're doing is you're looking for a pattern. So um, this is not quite satisfying. And on the other hand, if you try to just take like the, the recent trend of deep learning, what people do is, well, they say source code is really like natural language. It's a sequence of words, so I'll just apply my R and N on it, and then I'll just do whatever I did for natural language. And then it turns out, oh, well, actually, yeah, there, there's like these keywords that have meaning in programs, and while doesn't quite mean the same in, in natural language as in a loop. And then sometimes you, you end up like your vocabulary is gigantic because while you have like maybe 2,000 words that you use in English regularly, you use tens of thousands of variable names regularly and APIs and all of these things. And these, these things have meanings even though you only see them seldomly. And then finally, uh, in natural language, I usually refer to things that I just said uh, in, in the sentence before or maybe a few sentences before, and I'm not just randomly referring to something that I said half an hour ago, whereas we live in programs with just referring to a constant defined in some file somewhere else. So there is this long distance thing that doesn't quite match the, the natural language angle. And so some people try to handle this with trees, which kind of take care of like this AST structure, but it's still not very satisfying. And so this idea arose to use graphs to, to model programs, because this is like what people like to do in, in program analysis anyway, because graphs are such a nice modeling tool. And so you can essentially think about the nodes are some, something that actually occurs in your program, and then you, you label it by some kind of semantic information, and then on the other side you have like some edges that connect these nodes and they, they den, uh, denote some relationships between these things in your source code. And so this is the basic idea that Martin had a few years back on uh, 
uh, in JS Nice with uh, conditional random fields, where essentially you take a, a graph view of, of things, but this is not deep learning, and so it's not quite 2018. And so uh, we, we do this uh, in a slightly different way. But the important thing to notice is like, that this way of modeling things means we can take existing static analyses and just shove all the information that we can cheaply extract into something as essentially a glorified feature that can be used by a deep learning tool. And so how do we do that? So let's say we have a little program and want to turn it into a graph. Let's take this little statement here. And the first thing you do is, well, you take it, you take the tokenizer, you turn it into a token stream, and then you connect these things and say, oh, there's a next token. That one was easy. And then you do the AST. Well, in this case, it's actually a syntax tree because it connects everything. Um, and then you have like edges for the child relationship. And now what could you do for, for example, semantic relationships? You could say, well, I, I want to look at data flow. So you take a program like this and you say, oh, so when was this X actually last written? And then you can do like the usual data flow analysis and you do all of that. You have many edges and you do like when was it last used, for example, because it was in a condition. Uh, and then you say, oh, X is computed from this and that. And you get more and more of these edges. And you can see you can essentially take any analysis and turn it either into some additional information on the node or you can turn it into a relationship. And maybe you might need to reason about hypergraphs and hyperedges, but we are lazy and didn't do this yet, but it's not a problem to extend the method to that. And so, uh, as I said, you want to have somehow node representations. And so the, the one thing that, I, uh, that we actually used as, as semantic information about nodes, sure, What's, what's the killer app you have in mind? Uh, well, the, the example that I showed you where we find the variable that was used in, in a wrong way is one thing. But actually, it's more about can we, can we actually use deep learning to do anything with this? And can we start extracting patterns? I'll get to a few things that we did with this later on. Um, but like the, the one killer app that already works is this variable misuse stuff. Um, so how do we integrate uh, semantic information? Well, we kind of have to dive into how, how neural networks work in, uh, for a little bit now. Uh, so the idea is we know, well, it's like some variable called outfile prefix, and we know it's of type string. And so what we do is this outfile prefix, we use like natural language tools. We, we split it into outfile and prefix. We embed them separately. That gives us some vectors. And then we do some combination of these things so that we have a single vector representing the name. And for the type, we do the same thing. We look at all the types that are implemented by this. Um, we embed them separately, and then we combine them to something, and then we concatenate the whole representation. And of course, you could have many, many more paths that go here on the side, and somehow you get some representation at the end, and you can just insert extra information. So if you have a flag of this is null or not null, you could insert it here at this point, for example. And then you get these graphs, and so this is the nice graph, and this is the, the actual dot rendering of some trivial example. So uh, these graphs become very large, and it's not useful to reason about them anymore manually in any way. Um, and so for, for most of these samples that we uh, looked at for this variable misuse thing, uh, on average we have about 3,000 nodes and 10,000 edges. So it's a little bit large and we have to think about how to reason about them. And so I said all of these things and I said, oh, now we have graphs, but you don't really know how to learn from graphs. So this is the other problem that we had to tackle. And this is some work that we did three years ago, building on, on older work, uh, but, but still trying to, to essentially figure out how, to, how do we extend sequence reasoning to graph reasoning. And so I'll briefly uh, recap how RNNs actually work, because I, I don't know in this audience who knows. So the idea is you have like just this chain of data, like a sentence. And then what you do is you introduce this recurrent unit, which is really just a function that takes the old state that you had before, some new input, and then decides how to merge these two bits of information. It can decide to forget something about the old state, bring something in about the new state, and somehow combine them. These are learnable components. In the end, it's really just three matrix multiplications. And then the way it works is you embed a word that gives you like a little vector, which I represent by these envelopes. And then you have some initial state here, which is usually just zero or something that you come up with. And then you go and see, oh, so I, I take the, the embedding of the first word, the initial state, I pass it through this recurrent unit. That gives me a new state. And then I repeat the process. And the recurrent unit is always the same. It's just being replicated. So I can do this many, many times. And this goes on and on. And I have a wonderful animation for this. 
And uh, because we are here, this is like the, the, the reasonable way of describing this. So if you say the recurrent unit is really just a function that takes a state and an input, um, then an R and N is really just a thing that folds over the, the sequence with some initial state and applies the recurrent unit. Um, or in my graphical notation like this. Pictures are nice. Okay, so graphs. Nothing of what I showed before applies now because there is not a single sequence anymore. So what do we do? We essentially go back and say, okay, we have some way of embedding the labels of these nodes that gives us a vector that represents the node. And then I'm going to show you, well, um, we say there's different types of edges that connect these things. Um, for example, two types, green and yellow. Um, and then I use the same trick with the recurrent unit now, but now I have to deal with the fact that I might have several successors or predecessors at each time step. And so what I do is I say, let's say I want to update the state here. And I decide, so I take all the, the neighbors, I pass them through this edge-specific neural network, which changes the color of my state. And I do this for all the neighbors, and so I have some information about my local neighborhood now. And then I combine it, and the, the sad fact is that the combination that works best in practice is the sum, which is somehow displeasing that it's such a simple thing. Um, and then I pass all of these through the recurrent unit as before. And then I can do all of this in parallel at the same time for all nodes in my graph. And what that essentially means is that after one step, each of these nodes has information about its neighborhood one step away. And if I redo this, then it has information about its two-step neighborhood, and so on. And I can run this uh, process for a fixed number of time steps, and it essentially gets some visibility of its neighborhood. Um, and so uh, this is a very powerful uh, mechanism that, that has started to actually, a new kind of model class that has actually started to be used in all kinds of places. Do you have a cycle problem? Um, no, because you... Um, so yes, in principle yes, but no. Uh, what happens is because you only look at your local neighborhood at each time step and you don't have to run to convergence, you just unroll for a certain number of time steps, the cycles don't matter. You are not traversing the cycles until convergence or anything. It's just you do it for a few steps and then you're fine. And be, you just use the old state from the last time step at each point. So once around this... There's no, and then, then no probably get back to the, the original. Yes, thing. yes, it comes back, but it kind of learns to essentially discount the information that, that uh, is echoed back. Or we've also, I mean, we analyzed how these things work. And so, for example, if you want to look at uh, determining how large is, the, uh, is a graph, what happens that it does like this, this echo thing, um, where it sends essentially a message out from something and then waits until it uh, comes back to kind of count uh, how many messages are flowing back. Um, okay, so this is a powerful mechanism, and it's used in all kinds of different applications in machine learning now. Um, from, for example, I use this for heap verification things, but then other people use it for jet physics and all kinds of things. It's really just a very powerful way of, of representing structured data. And it works uh, reasonably well, so we have an open source implementation of this just as a commodity layer, just as an RNN as a commodity layer. Um, and it's sufficiently fast in practice. So you can train this on like 1.4 million nodes per second on, on a decent uh, NVIDIA card that you can buy on the market right now. Um, and so it's fast enough to actually be used in practice. And I should say our colleagues at uh, DeepMind have realized that this is a good idea as well and just released their own implementation of this. Um, and so it's, it's really just an area where if you decide to do something with graphs, you can find things to, to do deep learning on graphs. So this is actually the main part of the message that I wanted to send today. Um, so how do we actually use this to, to tie back to the task of, of this variable misuse thing? So I, Nick? Yeah. Um, oh, for a sequential, it's hard to uh, to combine uh, to, to, to compare the two because usually. So this, oh, this is not on the slide. What this means is it does um, eight uh, time steps of propagating information, and so this would be comparable to essentially an eight-layer uh, recurrent neural network, and then the performance is very, very similar. So it's almost as fast as. Uh, um, as RNNs, and the way to think about it, it scales in the number of edges, and there's almost no overhead for the, the weird structure. Uh, 
Um, okay, so uh, how to do variable misuse uh, thing with here. So I said already how we transform programs into graphs, and now we do just a little bit of extra work, and we say, so we introduce this extra node here for where I want to insert something, and we introduce nodes for the candidates that I could put there, and then I, I run my GNN thing, and it gives me representations for all the nodes, and then I can train this end-to-end -end and say I want to, to maximize the probability of picking the right variable at this point. So uh, the probability of picking the, oh, oh, I don't have the formula here, is really just uh, a single neural network that takes the concatenation of this and that, and the, the concatenation of this and that, and produces a score, and you want to have a high score for the thing that's correct and a low score for the thing that's wrong. And then you can do this easily on, on a lot of data, and then you, you train this, uh, let's just skip this part, um, and then you can see, well, you can run this and with 86.5% uh, 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 accuracy, you pick the right variable if you train this on, on some data, which was about 2 million lines of code. And then if you go to a larger project and, and pick a larger number, the accuracy goes up. And so now what you see is, well, it's... 92% or almost 92% accuracy, but that doesn't really tell you anything about how likely it is to find bugs, because in the end, you do this for every uh, place where you use a variable, and then you try to, to say, oh, if, if the network disagrees with you, that might be a potential bug. And So the way you deal with that is that all of these predictions come with a probability or a certainty, a confidence of the neural network, and you can say you only show these things where the neural network is really, really certain. And then the numbers go down to, so the accuracy numbers go up into the 99 point something percent if you only show these things, and you get very little noise. Um, okay, and so, uh, as I said, there's like other tasks that you might want to do with this. Um, later. <laughs> uh, so, uh, for example, you want, I said you want to talk about uh, uh, handling changes. And so one interesting thing that Martin also started looking at, or actually Veselin as well, who was somewhere, uh, uh, and then you, uh, you think about, so I want to, to take all these changes that people did and find like what are the, the changes that they do over and over, because that's essentially something that the compiler should warn you about if, if you're making the same mistake, or the linter at least. And so if uh, you can use a very similar encoding as before, and, and so this is currently under submission, um, but it's, it's using really the techniques as, as before. Uh, you take like these pieces of code where you do a change, you encode them into a graph, you get a representation of the whole thing, somehow taking the context into account, and then you say, uh, I map them to some vector, and uh, you do this, uh, this whole thing, and then you kind of start seeing, oh, there's this interesting behavior where similar changes form clusters. And you find, for example, the, this orange cluster here, uh, those changes where someone took a link query in C-sharp that was slightly not optimal because it was using where of a condition and first or default, even though first or default takes a condition itself. And you see like these things where, where people just merge it into the shorter form. Or this is uh, a change where you use newer C-sharp syntactic sugar. And you can see all of this working in, uh, 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 on, on larger examples as well. And so the, the interesting thing is, of course, these examples are like the changes that people do hundreds of thousands of times. So literally, we have clusters of hundreds of thousands of these changes in, in our data set. But it's more interesting to do this on like project specific data and it works the same way. You have like a small project and uh, you get new people in and they always make the same mistake and you can find this thing that you always teach them in their first week and suddenly turn it into a linter rule so it doesn't have to go through code review anymore. And this is really the interesting thing that we want to, uh, to do in the future. And so the, the key points really here is that Graph neural networks are, are a super successful way of learning of structure, from structured data. Um, and you can reuse this machinery all the time. And you learn these soft rules that are not quite like a linter rule or a coverity rule or something like that, but it's just extracted from data, kind of best practices that you want to follow. And we found a number of bugs in mature code. We found like null pointer exceptions in weird paths in Roslyn that are never actually executed, but it turns out the code was obviously wrong the moment you looked at it, but no one really did at any point. Well, someone wrote it, but well. 
Okay, so I want to do a very short segment on generating program with essentially the same idea, or generating any structured thing. So um, the proxy task that I wanted to look at is you take a piece of code and instead of guessing a variable, you now want to guess the condition. It's a much harder task, of course, because who knows what you actually wanted to do here. But you kind of see, well, you're accessing something here and then you build the difference. So it's probably something that involves these two variables here. And so a reasonable guess, which is actually the right uh, thing, would be to say you want to ensure that the number that comes out is uh, positive. Why is it actually not uh, greater or equal? I have no idea. Uh, so this is, again, taken from Roslyn because we do everything on C-sharp because we have all the tooling in place. Um, and so the idea that we have here is we use the same technique as before. We take the program, we punch a hole into it, we build a, a GNN, and we get a representation of what the program context looks like. And then we start generating a piece of code. And how do we do that? Well, we do this grammar-based expansion that works well. Um, but we do it uh, in a probabilistic way where we are conditioned on what we've seen so far, what we've generated so far. And so we just have to, at each point, we have to pick a rule, and then we have to, to continue the expansion. And at some point, we might notice, oh, we want to pick a variable here. And so variables are one of these things that are special in code. They're not just words that float around where you, that you want to have in your grammar. You want to pick a variable from your context. And so what we do when we generate uh, a representation of our context, we also generate a representation of the variables. And then when we want to generate a variable in our expression, we just have to pick the right one. And of course, now you'll ask what happens if I do something to my variable in the piece of code or if I introduce a new one, and that will be covered on the next slide. So uh, let's say, just to walk you through this uh, very briefly, well, you say you have an expression here, and then you expand it based on some rule that you have in your uh, grammar. Um, and then you do this repeatedly, and we, we fix the expansion order to be uh, left to right uh, uh, depth first. And so we do this repeatedly, and so at this point we've decided to, to name a variable, and so we just have to look at the representations of these things that I have in scope and pick the right one. So this happens, and so we continue and continue, and now we say, oh, want to pick a variable here. But suddenly, I'm not interested in the representation of i that was there before, but in the more recent version of i that I used already in my code. Had I declared it and initialized it, it would have still been that i and not another one. And so you continue and continue, blah, blah. Um, so the edges here now, because I want to do everything as graphs, are the same as before. So I have AST childs, I have a next token that I can just thread through what I generated to kind of uh, keep track of what I've done so far. And I can use these next use uh, uh, things that uh, just uh, show how my, my information flows through variables. And so. Um, one thing that, uh, that we can observe here is um, actually what we would want to do when we generate this subtree here, we want to take into account what we've done before, right? And so this is actually a well-studied problem uh, in, in compiler theory. Um, you want to, when you, when you look or parse a part of the code, uh, somehow take into account what you've done so far. And one way of thinking about it is attribute grammars. And they are not like super actually in use, but they're a very nice formal uh, framework to think about these things. And so we, we just adapted this idea of attribute grammars to the neural setting. And the way we did this is we said every, um, every node in our graph now has an inherited attribute, which essentially just accumulates all the information that comes from the left and from the top. And it has a synthesized attribute, which just accumulates all the information that comes from the bottom. And then we have to, to just link these things up in the normal way. Um, and uh, we can use the information about, for example, uh, what happened before here to pick the variable i. Or we can use the information that came from here to pick the variable j, and things like that. Um, and so the way we, we do this now is the same as before for a graph neural network, but instead of just updating all the states at the same time, we now have a schedule in which we do the updates. So we first update the, the purple node up here, and then the purple node up here, and then the purple node up here. And if you, uh, if you follow these uh, things, you'll notice that if you just build a very nice DAG and it has a topological order, and so everything is always well-defined. 
Um, and then I can introduce additional information to essentially have shortcuts about how information flows. So I can say, oh, I connect back to my parents so that the, the synthesized attributes actually make sense. And then I can say, oh, I want to connect this to my next sibling because now I know what I did in my left subtree when I generate the right subtree and things like that. And so we implemented all of this um, for, for this task of really just filling in blanks and we compared to a number of baselines. And the surprising thing is, so most of this table you should just ignore, uh, the surprising thing is you can get about 38% of these expressions right, which really just shows how predictable code is. So we went through a lot of effort of deduplicating things and making sure that we don't have the same data in the training set as in the test set. And it turns out the most reliable prediction that we can make is I++ because it's a very common expression, it turns out. Um, and we didn't filter these things out, but then there's many others. So for example, the, the example that I showed with, uh, uh, with uh, the uh, if condition and the, the parameter count, we found that as well as the first hit, actually. And so we started, th this was really just a proof of concept of how to generate these things, and now we started to use this for program synthesis as well. Because the interesting thing now is that you, this framework gives you a way to marry this deep learning world with a, a deduction-based uh, view of things. And you can, for example, apply uh, Z3 to the partial program that you've generated so far, generate partial models of what you want to do, uh, and then feed that information back into your model when you make the next prediction and condition on something that comes out of, a, of an FSMT solver. And so this is essentially what we are working on right now. And so I wanted to, to briefly talk about what happens if you try to apply these things in practice and what happens if you try to learn from, uh, from people's style. So we apply, uh, this is dog fooding currently internally at Microsoft, this variable misuse thing, for example. And sometimes it works and people like it and it just shows up as like another pull review comment just as, as uh, someone else and they say, oh, this was actually wrong because I was using the wrong string here and it didn't trigger a test because like debug output is or logging output is never actually tested, um, but it, it was the right uh, thing and, and that's good. And so this is, this is like the nice part. <laughs> And then uh, the, the thing that we found incredibly helpful is this little button here with the apply fix. Because it turns out no one wants to go back to their editor. When you tell them what's wrong, give them the, the option to just click a button and fix it. They don't need to go back to their editor, especially if you are in the pull request. You can just generate a commit, put it on top of that, and be done with it. It's trivial, and it makes uh, users so much happier. And then there's like the weird. So Kenny is, uh, is an interesting partner engineering director for like the last 25 years at, at Microsoft somewhere in Visual Studio. And he started having a conversation with the bot. So the interesting thing is the bot doesn't see what he's writing. <laughs> this is really just like, and the, the, the bot is, is absolutely silent, but he manages to convince Kenny that he should change things, which is uh, really an interesting thing because uh, it also turns out that the thing that the bot said here was wrong. Um, but what happened is uh, that the code was really hard to understand. And Kenny kind of looked at this and said, oh, actually, I kind of see what's going wrong here. And then he thought about it a little bit longer and got a coffee and came back and said, okay, I'm going to rewrite this because if the bot doesn't understand it, maybe other humans don't understand it either. And so we're not sure if we should count that as a success or not, but it's an interesting observation. And then this happens. So this is, we try to infer names. And so this is in some test file. I'm, I'm sorry for the, the quality of the screenshot, it's, uh, it's horrific. And someone said, oh, I'm, I'm calling my telemetry writer variable telemetry writer. And our bot marches in and says, no, no, no. I learned the pattern, it's called W. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true because almost always people use the name W. <laughs> Um, but somehow now we are starting to propagate this bad pattern of bad behavior that people shouldn't really do. And so there's this risk of if you learn from data, you might not like what you learn. It might work, but not really in the way that you wanted it to work. Okay, so um, just to close now, the, the really interesting question that I've been studying for the last few years is how to actually learn from code that has semantics or any object that has semantics using deep learning. Um, and the idea really is that we are leveraging that there's this um, code ha has two audiences. It tries to target a machine and tell it what to do, and it tries to target you in six weeks trying to explain what the hell you did there. 
And the solution that we found for this is to, to marry this deep learning component that can deal with natural language and with uh, uh, semantics by using these graphs. And so, as I said, uh, we are hiring. <laughs> Thanks for the attention. Any questions? So is there a way to incorporate a notion of semantic bias into the, into the structure that you've got to avoid, for example, the, the example that you just showed? So bias is used very productively in lots of machine learning algorithms, and I was curious about how that sort of shows up in what you've done. Yes, but it feels like a hack, because essentially you see something that goes wrong, and then you introduce some specific bias that tries to solve this problem. It's very... Uh, yeah, I wasn't talking about a hack like that, but bias is a general principle, right? Mm. So but the problem is, how do you quantify bias? And usually the metrics that you use are based on the observations that you made of something going wrong. And uh, so, for example, we realize that uh, if we suggest names, very short names are not very informative. And so we use uh, essentially the length of the suggested name to, to downrate the probability um, of, of suggesting a short name. But I'm not sure if that's a good thing. And it feels very ad hoc to me, but it was practically useful. Okay, so I have a question about, uh, so you talked about book finding, but you didn't say anything about false positive rate. Um, so I can tell you, it, uh, I mean, it all depends uh, essentially on how we set this threshold at which we report things. Um, the problem with the false positive rate is we can report it on, um, on the dog fooding data that we have which is still very, fairly small. And we can't really give you a large-scale evaluation because there's no data set out there with actually ground truth. This was a bug, this wasn't a bug. Like, this is like what we manually collected over the last year. Um, depending on how we set the threshold, we can get the false positive rate to 10, 15%, but then recall suffers. Um, we haven't found a point with which we are happy, which is the reason why this is dog fooding and not publicly available. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if no more questions, let's thank uh, Mark again.